So I'm so very excited to be with all of you. Uh, the topic I've been asked to speak about is the role of the State Treasurer's Office uh, in public policy. And then as I walked in, it actually said uh, the role of public investment. So I'll just merge those two topics in my conversation. Uh, so as I glance over this room, it reminds me of a gathering that I attended about a month ago. I, I spoke at Comic-Con. And so it's not the costumes, but it's the, it's the subject matter. And I see some of you laughing, and actually some of you look like you might have been at Comic-Con. Uh, but the, we, uh, there was a series of uh, a few state elected officials, county officials, and local government officials who were asked to respond to three clips of scenes from some of the Marvel movies. And they were talking about some of the destruction that took place and those scenes and what the public response ought to be in regards to those scenes. And so they wanted various approaches from the various elected officials exercising our various responsibilities and backgrounds as to how to address those particular matters. Right? And as obviously as we are in today's politically charged environment, they were asking for you know, who were the villains who were the heroes? Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately for some, right, the conversation quickly focused back to Washington, D.C., and some actors back in Washington, D.C. Some of the individuals were talking about you know, drawing parallels. I tried to draw a larger sense on some of the critical issues and issues that your dean brought up in the brief conversation that I had with them prior to uh, joining with all of you tonight. Because a, a few of those critical issues are issues that are existential, uh, issues that you may not think are in the main focus of the state banker, right? And for those of you who aren't familiar with the roles and responsibilities of the treasurer's office, I am your banker. Uh, the focus of the state treasurer's office and the 400 staff and direct and indirect staff that operate under the auspices of the state treasurer's office, climate change and income inequality. Right, so when I think about how do we move forward in California in the 21st century, what do we have to get absolutely correct? Right, the issues are education, income inequality, and climate change. And so obviously here at Cal, you understand the value of education. We understand uh, the value not only of the education, but what it does to spawn communities and what it does to spawn a state like the state of California. We are today the world's sixth largest economy. We've had a dramatic recovery preceding the recession. We're the world's eighth largest economy, and we started to slip to the world's 12th largest economy. And your leadership here had to endure extraordinary struggle. And some of the students in here are paying the price in fact, and the faculty and the administration when the leadership in Sacramento does not get its finances correct. Right? And that's why I have fought for sustainable, intelligent, long-term observations and viewpoints in regards to financing and funding of the critical services and programs in our great state. Because if you had witnessed where we were, not only was the state in massive cash deficit, budgetary deficit, and other particular areas, but the University of California was resource challenged, but the state of California had to borrow $2 billion from the investment front from the University of California to keep the operations of the state ongoing and not to have a position where we would go into technical default. And then lending further credence to that point is that when you think about that 10 year period of time surrounding that last recession, we increased the burdens on students by increasing, or the Board of Regents, increasing tuition and fees by 113% on UC students, on Cal State students, and 130% on the community college students. And that's not sustainable for the future of California to place that level of debt on the seed corn of California's future. And though people oftentimes will discard and minimize the value of the discussions of money, we know for so many 
of the essential conversations and the honest conversations that we need going forward. We're going to have to be honest, straightforward, and making very difficult decisions in that particular regard. And then so I wanted to thank Michael Nock for your leadership and your vision to making sure that we have these types of conversations in a place that's known for its expression, it's known for its intellectual integrity, and it's known for its seriousness and its pursuit of public policy. And so in that particular regard, the Treasurer's Office and what we're working on uh, is the financing operation for the state of California. And so on a daily basis, we're engaged in the investment of 65 to $85 billion. So we invest the state's money, many of the local government's money. We ha harbor relationships with dozens of various banking institutions. And we try to use those relationships to help the economic progress of institutions, but more importantly, individuals. Right, so as we treat a child going through the school system, going through local communities, we try to do that with the financial institutions here in California. So oftentimes when we can, we like to invest in smaller banks, help them grow to become bigger banks, to accept larger responsibilities, and take ownership of their communities. And why we do that is I chair 12 economic development authorities. In the Treasurer's Office, we finance things from restaurants to EV charging stations to affordable housing to mental health to children's hospitals to Tesla to aerospace companies and run the gamut. And so we wanted to make sure that we have individuals who are connected together. One of the vibrant conversations and decision points that we were engaged in in my conversation with the dean and Dean Chavez was talking about the research that is being done in regards to the diversity. And what makes California extraordinarily special and why I like to highlight California is that I think we portend the best opportunities in the 21st century. We are the leading economic engine and still the wealthiest country on this planet and in the history of this earth. Now we still have sizable challenges going forward. When you just think demographically, you have countries such as China and India that are three and a half times larger than we are. And so when you just think about the employment of technologies, the sharing of knowledge, the access to education, right, that gap is closing rather dramatically. But if we want to be successful, I think one of the fundamental tenets that is exercised here in the Goldman School and at Cal is understanding how you bring together an incredibly diverse pool of individuals. Right? Even though they may have diverse backgrounds, I don't want the differences to set us apart, as has happened across this nation and unfortunately has been exercised by the failure of leadership by some individuals back in Washington, D.C. And from the state's banker's vantage point, when I talk about the economics and when I talk about the finances to those who invest in the state of California, I talk about the fact that our top three trading partners are Mexico, Canada, and China. And when you look at this state today where we are nearly 40% Latino, 38% Caucasian, 16% Asian American, 6% African American, we have the sky above us, right? We have bountiless opportunities if we can learn how to work together live together, play together, in fullest extent and, and further support of each other. It is an unprecedented opportunity that we hope we all understand and we seek. And I think it's important that our public leadership in Sacramento understand and support public policy initiatives based on the evidence and based on a lot of the efforts and work that is taking place here at the Goldman School to enact policies that will drive California's future. And so I've tried to make sure that our state reflects that type of activity. Steve Silverstein is very engaged and just told me he has become a public official, has joined the Marin Pension Authority. Steve has pushed aggressively 
on the ESG front for pension plans, making sure that we deploy our capital in the most exacting, in the most enhancing, life-affirming, and financially productive manner possible. And so I've tried to do that, not only the governance of why we're gathered here in regards to public policy, but also public policy in working in furtherance of private sector activity. How do we bring those incredible talents together to the public and private governance of the United States of America? And so two of the authorities that I sit on are two of the largest defined benefit plans in the United States of America. And in fact, they are the two largest, CalPERS and CalSTRS. So early in my service in my previous office as a state controller, I wanted to make sure that the corporate boards reflected the talent pool and the diverse, diverse skill set and an understanding of the diverse markets that make up the United States of America and that make up the global investment market. So I pushed for more people of color on corporate boards. The next year, I pushed for more women on corporate boards, right? Because you had that old example from decades ago where you had Avon, and we know the products that Avon sells, having one or zero women on their corporate boards, right? It makes no sense. There was no reason to not have somebody who is using those products representing the experience, the knowledge, the skill set at the highest levels of decision making in the particular private sector. And to reflect the extraordinary diversity that is taking place, I later pushed for members of the LGBTI community. And then two years ago, when I was back in New York after speaking at a conference, a gathering, hosted by Ceres and others on climate change, the, I was speaking with the UN permanent ambassador from France at a meeting convened by New York State City, Con uh, I'm sorry, New York City controller Scott Stringer on climate change. And I wanted to make sure that our corporate boards were sensitive to the dramatic impact that climate change would have on economic activity forthcoming. And so one of the programs that we push is pushing for greater expertise on the private sector side in regards to climate change risk going forward. And so that captures a lot of the activity academically that's being reflected in your school. Climate change, education, healthcare. And so on that particular front, we know that we can be devastatingly impacted by the discussions that are taking place and the subsequent action back in Washington, D.C. In Sacramento, just a few months ago, we just passed the healthiest budget in the history of the state of California, an all-in budget of over $180 billion, a general fund budget of approximately $125 billion, a dramatic increase from the recession years when we were 2008, 2009, when we were looking at a general fund budget of less than $88 billion, right, where we deferred education payments over those next few years by $10 billion, where we reduced healthcare payments to those in greatest need in the state of California, where we delayed investment or deferred investment in infra infrastructure, where we repealed the economic tools that we gave to local governments and creating the challenges that we all experience today. So we've made dramatic progress. We paid back that $30 billion in cash deficit uh, that we owed at one point in time. We have reduced the amount of money and the credit spreads between us and AAA rated states. And the fact is, the fact that we have enhanced our financial position has allowed me as the state treasurer to refinance debt the same way as if you were refinancing your mortgage, your student loan debt, your credit card debt, I've been able to refinance the state's general obligation bonds when we had their earliest window of opportunity so that over a 30 year period of time, we, have sa we will save the taxpayers of California $5.9 billion. Now to give you a sense of that, now that's over that 30 year period of time, the state's annual contribution 
to the University of California system is about $3.3 billion. So it is absolutely material to the health. But the implications of the discussions in Washington, D.C. can be very dire for all of us. Right? If you have the passage of the health proposal in the United States House of Representatives, we would look at a loss of $6 billion to the coffers of the state of California. If you're looking at the full repeal of the Affordable Care Act, over the next 10 to 15 years, right, they would move it in over a period of time, we're looking at a loss of 23 to 24 billion dollars to the state of California. And so we know that that would exacerbate an already challenged fiscal state. So one of the things going forward, and that I just wanted to re reinforce and thank the work that's being done here, is the initial issue that I brought in regards to income inequality. So despite the fact that we're the highest performing economy on many metrics in the United States of America, this state is still the state with the highest percentage of poverty. The numbers that were recently released the past few days by the United States Census in regards to supplemental measurements still indicate that one in every five Californians live in poverty. And so this state is at a point at a, at a very delicate balance, right? Any dip in a, our economy would dramatically change the station of millions of Californians. And so the work that you gather here today is absolutely critical. And so I just want to conclude by thanking each and every single one of you for your extraordinary support of the Goldman School. But I look important to the, the relevance and the, uh, the merit of the work that's being engaged. This state would not simply succeed if not for the work by institutions and the leadership and by the graduates of this prestigious institution and this particular school. So as we go forward, whether the challenge comes from Washington, D.C., whether the challenge comes from local communities, whether the challenge comes from international perspectives, we must stand together as Californians and retain the highest aspirations and the belief in what we can work and accomplish together. Thank you very much. So thank you. Uh, that was great coverage of the exciting things. And, and I know they seem dull to some people, but it really is exciting to get budgets in order and to make them work well. And one of the things that's happened in the last few years in the state of California is we've been able to get our budget uh, in order. We still have problems, though. And so one of the ones I wanted to ask you about is young people, uh, on the one hand, are struggling with the tuition that, unfortunately, we've had to uh, charge here and at the CSUs and even at the uh, community colleges uh, because of cuts in state funding. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we have expenditures on pensions and other kinds of activities uh, that are really quite substantial. So some cities, for example, are finding now that a large fraction of their budgetary uh, intake, the money that they raise, goes towards pensions. What do you see as the long-term situation with respect to young people? Are they going to have the opportunity in the future given the financial situation of the state, given the expenditures that are being put into things like pensions and other things, uh, how do you see the future of young people in California? Will there be investments in them? So, the, so you ask a great question. So the, if I can take a different approach to it, I believe California's youth will have extraordinary opportunities if we place the proper investment in communities. Right, you have all those studies that take place that, you know, if you come from a wealthy background, you, your kids will perform very well. The challenge today is that we have entrenched cycles of poverty. And so what can we do in those communities that have lower wealth, lower opportunities, to bring together businesses, to bring together public institutions, to bring together NGO communities, to make sure that those who come from less wealthy communities get the type of same public investment 
possible. Uh, so that first approach needs to do, what can we do to make sure that you have proper school site leadership so that regardless of what community you live in, kids get great access to education? What do you do to make sure that in every classroom that you have a teacher that is well-led, well-trained, well-supported, right? That increases teacher performance. Uh, in addition, what do you do to change the direction of healthcare access, right? In a lot of the lower income communities, you have parents who are struggling to make it, so they have very difficult decisions. How do I get my child to school? If my child is sick, how do I get them healthcare? And you have a det detachment from Right, they're oftentimes taking public transportation. We need to re-aggregate, we need to rethink leadership so that you have the county, schools, NGOs working together to make sure that you get the kids to school, the parents can be there, and they have access to all the services that they need. Right? Now, that doesn't get to quite yet your pension issues. For local governments, right, the four largest expenditures are police, firefighters, used to be parks and recreation, rec, parks and rec, and library services. You have the creep for healthcare obligations and pension obligations. Just as an example, you're, there is no silver bullet that fully addresses the OPEB obligation, that's other post-employee benefits, which is healthcare, and pension obligations. But we're gonna have to take individual actions to try to start to take down some of those liabilities. So for instance, during this last budget cycle, Governor Brown and I introduced a proposal, which uh, is now in law, to move $6 billion out of the short-term investment pool, and I invest the short-term investment pool, and give it to CalPERS if they hit their 7% bogey over a 20-year period of time it takes down that $59, $58, 59000000000 billion obligation by $11 billion, right? It doesn't solve it, but it's those types of actions to start reducing the obligations that puts California back in a position to better financial health. And if you reduce that obligation, that frees up money so that we can invest it Right. for University of California, Cal State, community college students. I should say that's one of those wonky things that's even hard to describe what went on, but actually it looks like it actually will save a lot of money and is a very smart move to make at this point in order to avoid future uh, costs that would, would exist. Yeah, I, I, I only go through that type of depth at a public policy school. Yeah, okay, right. <laughs> uh, so. One of the arguments that could be made is that one way we make sure our future, and you've sort of made this, that if we could invest in people, uh, then they're more productive, and if they're more productive, that can help us have higher tax revenues because they make more money at the same tax rate, you get more tax revenues and everybody's better off. So one way to invest in people might be to have a way to have zero tuition for students. So New York recently became the first state in the US to offer tuition free college education. The state of California is talking about, there's a bill I think on the governor's desk that would say the first year of full time community college students would be essentially cost free in terms of tuition. Uh, how do you think about, what do you think uh, about uh, essentially tuition free college? Uh, so. So I would start, so if we want to do full free tuition, it's about $9 billion. Estimates are about $9 billion uh, for, this, for the state of California. Community college is, is actually very affordable in regards to being able to cover free tuition. That would be, it's an estimate is anywhere from 50 to $75 million. The cost for higher education isn't really the tuition, it's the living costs surrounding it, right? And when you think about so many individuals uh, when you talk about some of the studies that you read in just in the mainstream media, you know, 10% of California's kids are housing challenged, or 10% of the kids at the Cal State University system are housing challenged. When I spoke at the Community College Student Senate gathering last year with about 1,000 students, I had seven students come up after uh, my speech and said, hey, John, can you talk to the trustees at Mount San Antonio College uh, we're living out of our cars. They won't let us stay in our cars in their parking lots on the school grounds where it's safer, right, versus being on the streets, streets in those particular communities. So the, 
I like the Tennessee model for community colleges, but we have to make some variations for California because our, our, the differences in our homelessness in, in regards to our food insecurity. Uh, but Tennessee provides free community college. What it does is it says you have to apply for fed, all free federal aid, right? You either work a, a certain amount or you uh, engage in public service and the state makes up the difference. Right? And I know for so many lower income California families, that's a challenge to be a full-time student on the track uh, to graduation. So I would make some adjustments uh, so that they still would qualify and get state aid or state assistance so that they can move through college. But right, that community college certainly has to be that first, for me, the first immediate bridgeway to higher education. So as I heard you, I didn't hear you say that you thought that free college tuition for UC, for example, was a good idea or a bad idea. You just, you didn't really address that. So I'd like so to- I'm gonna ask so again. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'd like to get there, uh, right? The, we have to put something in process, but we're not gonna get there immediately. Right. Do, do so you have at least start dropping costs at least, and then covering more of the cost for those who have greater financial challenges. So you'd start by focusing on making sure you had more aid for people with greater financial challenges. That's correct. Okay. I mean, there are, there are those who say that free tuition has the unfortunate side effect of it means that rich people in the state of California get free tuition and maybe they shouldn't be subsidized in that way and, until we've made sure that poor people and middle class people have a chance to have aid to get to college and succeed in college. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about corrections and uh, the costs in the criminal justice system. Uh, one of the disconcerting facts about the nation right now is there are many states in which corrections and criminal justice costs outpace higher education subsidies and costs. Uh, in California, it's sort of neck and neck. Uh, what needs to be done to maybe invest more in higher education and less in criminal justice? So we need to, the, when we're just investing in higher education, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Right, the, you, you need to invest early on, and so I am a huge proponent of investment in early childhood education, uh, right? Because obviously, if you haven't learned how to read, right, that old adage, by third grade, you're, you're in trouble. Uh, and you start to see material differences between individuals from different communities uh, really start to parse out uh, in early years in elementary school. So if you want to keep somebody out of incarceration, right, you need to make that investment early on. And so we need to change our early childhood education system in California so that it's a full day system. You can't have half days where you have especially individuals from low income families that have to go pick up their child in the middle of the day who can't take, you know, the rest of the day off to pick up their child, right? So we have to tie, tie early childhood education with child care so that it makes sense uh, in everyday Californians' life. Uh, in regards to incarceration, uh, so we've dropped our uh, inmate population dramatically. We know that during that last re recession, the federal government uh, took federal receivership of the incarceration system of the state of California because we had significant overcrowding. We had about 180,000 incarcerated individuals in the state of California. Our system was developed. Uh, built uh, a design for between 118 to 121,000 uh, uh, individuals, uh, you know, give or take care, depending on how you include the facilities. Uh, we dropped that down substantially. I just talked to the secretary. Uh, we were on, at a gathering, the same gathering last week, and he says it's down to about 130-something individuals. But what we need to do is we need to invest more because people are invested in rehabilitation programs. So while we're moving people out, we haven't put the individuals who had been incarcerated in a position where they can be successful outside of the gates, right? We started investing in the GED programs. They have the GED programs, but they don't have the life skill and employment skills to be successful in the private sector. So we need to make sure that next design incorporates those types of activities so that they can be reintegrated in the community in a very positive and fruitful manner for them. Uh, let's turn to infrastructure. Oh, can I add one more thing on that? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Part, part of the high incarceration costs is health care. The aging population, right, so we have people who are incarcerated who are 
you know, in their late 60s, their late 70s. And one of the major factors of why people who, who recommits a crime, uh, you know, where the recidivism is, as you age, you know, as the correctional officers like to say, the, the older folks just have less energy, right? So when they're in their 40s, when they're 50s, and they start to pause and they reevaluate their life, right? They want that chance if they get the opportunity for freedom. I, I know that my criminal career is behind me. <laughs> um, so I, I want to talk about infrastructure. So we have a note here from a hydrologist uh, who says, I'm terrified by the future of California's water infrastructure. Our water infrastructure is incapable of dealing with the intensifying weather pattern, droughts, floods, we all know about that, in, in a warming climate, and it is in desperate need of public investment to improve and to modernize. Uh, and then a, a related question uh, is, while this is an issue that Bernie Sanders has talked about and Donald Trump have talked about it, is anybody going to really do something about it? And can the state of California do something about infrastructure? So it's not just our water infrastructure, it's also our roads and, and many other public uh, kinds of facilities. What kind of plan would you have for dealing with public infrastructure? So the conversations in Washington, D.C. ought to be disconcerting for California in regards to our financial wherewithal to address the financing of critical programs and services, including infrastructure. Right, the, the idea about the re eliminating the ability for individuals to deduct their state taxes from their federal schedule will have dramatic impact. The fact that there's a discussion which I don't think is gonna go any further in regards to eliminating the deductibility of interest on your bonds, uh, which would have a dramatic impact on investment on infrastructure. Uh, and the fact that they're shifting $55 billion into the military and away from other types of services and programs. That will basically shift a lot of that financial obligations onto individual states. Now, with that as a premise, the state of California needs this to go forward. We don't have a central inventory of the state's assets. The, uh, the, uh, why I appreciate the dean's geekiness is he read my biannual report and he goes, the, uh, and as we sat down together like half an hour ago, it goes, I really like your infrastructure discussion, right? The, uh, the only engineers like the infrastructure discussion. The, uh, so, but what I had proposed was a framework for looking at infrastructure for the state of California. First of all, we need a central inventory of all the state's assets. Number two, you need to look at the useful life of all those assets, right? Oroville Dam, right? If it's in existence for 60 years and its useful life is 50 years, Right, right. we should have thought that, hey, some impending disaster may have happened. And I'm not saying those numbers are correct, I'm just using it as an example, right? But we have a lot of bridges, roadways, dams that are at its useful life expectancy or have surpassed its useful life. So, and we don't want the calamities that we witnessed in Minnesota where bridges collapsing and people losing their lives. So we need a s inventory, useful life, then look at beneficiary use, who uses that particular asset. And then from that, you come together and determine what funding and financing formula to pay for that particular asset. And you have a public discussion. And then in the public financial realm, I want to make sure that the taxpayers of California pay not a penny more than we have to in regards to the borrowing or the funding of that particular debt. So for instance, there are a lot of smaller jurisdictions that are paying higher amounts than they need to just because they're a smaller jurisdiction. They don't have the financial wherewithal to negotiate aggressively with bond counsel or underwriters or financial advisors. So what I had proposed was to create a center for financial excellence where we would aggregate a lot of these projects right, local ju jurisdictions coming together, and we would go to those aforementioned and negotiate lower rates, right? Why should local governments be paying four, five, six, seven, eight percent interest on that borrowing when we can drive it down below 2%, saving taxpayers a lot of money? So that's, that's the approach to infrastructure that I would take. And water would be part of it. Oh, and then the earlier phrase, yes, our water infrastructure is out of date, Right, because our water infrastructure was built on the design that basically, you know, out of every decade, we get 
you know, three major years of snowfall, right? And the snowfall would be collected, right? And then as it melted, we had the reservoirs to collect it, and then, right, you would move the water when, when appropriate. Today, we know that, you know, you get a lot more precipitation instead of snowfall. So as we witnessed during this past year, we, we had a lot of water. We had, you know, thousands, if not hundreds of thousands or millions of acre feet that were just not captured because our infrastructure was built for a different environmental, environmental background. So let's turn to the question of here, some great plans to do things. We need to deal with infrastructure. We probably should invest more in the young. We should have some good public spending policies. But the question is, how can we afford this? Uh, and you talked about the budgetary difficulties we've had. So let's just start with a very basic question, which is the tax base. Uh, this questionnaire wants to know, seeing how we are in the Stephen Bechtel room, how does California deal with company flight from California to greener fields? And this, of course, means the tax base uh, is decreased. Um, once Bechtel was a large Bay Area employer, today uh, virtually nobody is there in Bechtel. Uh, there's numbers given here, but it looks like they're all in rest in Virginia. So what do we do to make sure we retain companies in the state of California, or is this really not a problem? Uh, so this, this is a problem. The, uh, right, we, so over this past few years, we actually had more wealthier people move into the state of California relative to wealthier people leaving the state of California. But that doesn't mean there's not a problem. So when you think about our tax, the, the three big taxes for the general fund revenues of the state of California, and people get this wrong, are income taxes number one by far, by far, right? In a given year when it's a healthy economic year, right, the Steves and others pay anywhere from 65 to 70 uh, percent Oh, 65 to 70 percent of the state general fund revenues is personal income taxes, and the top five percent pay a huge chunk of that. The top one percent, you know, will be somewhere from 50 to 65,000 individuals, and that top one percent doesn't necessarily look the same year after year after year, right? Facebook doesn't go public every year, right? So it's Mark Zuckerberg is not realizing a billion dollars every year. Right, so th the idea is to keep it competitive enough so that we keep our top 1% here in the state of California, but they have to pay their fair share. F about 40 years it changed, right? So 40 years ago, sales tax was the number one source of general fund revenues in the state. But our economy has changed dramatically, right? Because we, we brought in sales taxes and income taxes during the, the Great Depression, right? A lot of states did. And so our sales tax laws, which are the transfer of title or possession of tangible personal property, was put into California law in 1933. And so we're living on rules that aren't quite a century old, but based on a different economy and doesn't have a lot of applicability for a, lo a lot of the transactions in the state of California. And then third largest source of general fund revenues is corporate taxes, and it doesn't make up for a lot, right? It makes up seven to nine percent of the state tax revenue. So we're really heavily dependent on the personal income taxes. So ours is, right, part of this is how do we add value? We're not really gonna drop those taxes for the immediate future, right, because if we drop those taxes, we're going to take away money from education, which is 50% of the general fund expenditures for the state of California. But what we have to do other better is that we have to make the regulatory regime easier to understand, more consistent so businesses understand what environment they operate in the state of California. We're going to have to make sure compliance is much more easy for the businesses, right? And so if we can streamline activity, so that businesses don't have to sit on capital three, five, seven years, but they can deploy it earlier. At least they can feel that they're getting an opportunity to get a return on their investment. So one of the problems, as you've noted, with our tax system is it's heavily reliant on the personal income tax, uh, and that that is very volatile. And in fact, much more volatile 
then uh, the, uh, the very, it's much more volatile even than the economy. So the taxes go up and down even more than the economy goes up and down because of the reliance upon the personal income tax. Are there ways to fix that? You say in the short run, maybe there's not something to do, but how about changing Prop 13? How about split role? Thinking about maybe changing the corporate part of Prop 13 so that we would actually split the roles and have a different way of dealing with the uh, corporate property taxes. So I would support, so the way the law is interpreted today, right, if you want to transfer, to trigger a reassessment under Prop 13, right, you have to change ownership 50% plus one. Mm -hmm. So you have all these brilliant tax lawyers who devise plans so that you never trigger reassessment. Mine would be, if you have a cumulative 50% plus one transfer of ownership, then you ought to trigger reassessment, right? There's a famous case down in Southern California. I believe it was a, a hotel. The Dell family purchased it, right? And originally, they were going to transfer more than 50% plus one. But once they understood the rules, they, I think they transferred like 37% then later transferred 17% or 20%. So ultimately, they transferred 50% plus one, but not at one time. I think we ought to fix that, because you had you know, the 50% plus one, so that you have fairness in the system. So you wouldn't necessarily change the rate, but you would change the point at which we trigger the change in rates that come from the fact that somebody has actually turned over a property. The cumul cumulative activity such that it yeah. meets the original threshold rule. Right. Uh, how does the California regain a, a double A uh, bond rating, a uh, higher bond rating, which is something that we've suffered from as a lower bond rating, which means it costs more to borrow money? Yeah, so we, California at one point had the lowest credit rating in the United States of America. Uh, we've made a little bit of progress. We're the 48th now, but the, we, have, we have the spreads down dramatically. So when I was the controller, California, or we, as taxpayers, we're paying 171 basis points, or 1.71% more than AAA rated states, right? We have that spread down, depending on issuance, anywhere from 30 to 42 basis points. And in fact, on some of the issuance, uh, right, because people were gonna attack me. Some of you know that I challenged Wells Fargo when they engaged in the r disgusting practices of opening accounts without the authorization and fraudulently against individuals, right? And they engage in auto practices, other types of practices. So I, I terminated the three highest pro profitable lines of businesses, Wells Fargo, until I could see a change of behavior from Wells Fargo. The, and so Wells Fargo is one of, the, one of the major underwriters for the state of California. In my first year in office, they had done three of the 11 deals that we went out for, and so people were concerned that California was gonna pay a price. Then when we went out, we actually outperformed states that had higher credit ratings, right? because I wanted to make sure we always work very aggressively. So I changed the way we do business in the treasurer's office. I alternate between negotiated and competitive, and for those who, who don't understand, Right, competitive is everybody uh, bids, and we give the contract to the lowest bidder. Negotiated is I negotiate with a particular vendor and give them the business, and we negotiate the rate they're going to get paid at. So I do this, competitive, negotiated. Competitive, whoever wins the competitive gets the next negotiated. They lead on the next negotiated to try to really drive down the practices and then when there's big financial firms that perform really poorly, we chew them out, right? We've had some of the biggest firms that aren't even close, and we said, you're not gonna have any chance for business because you're not even in the ballpark, right? So you're not, if you're not gonna exercise good faith on behalf of the taxpayers of the state of California, I'm not gonna let you to participate in getting the business of the state of California. Now get to, to get to the double A, California, as I mentioned, is double A minus, this is what they like about California. Strong economy, diverse economy, good financial management, right? During the recession, I was cited five times by the ratings agency as controller because they said we like the way John Chung handles money. 
right? The good thing is when Governor Brown came into office his second year, they said they liked the way Governor Brown is handling money, which is the right way to do it, right? It ought to be the governor exercising leadership that is recognized. What they don't like is frankly what we've chosen to do. Ratings agencies don't like Proposition 98, our guarantee for education. They don't like Proposition 13, reducing the flexibility. And so that's part of our structural challenges uh, to getting a higher rating. So how do you make this stuff uh, sexy to people? Uh, you're, you're based on uh, how well you've managed money, which is great. Uh, I note, for example, we have a president who claims that he's a good manager, but he went bankrupt several times, and, and, and mm -hmm. you have not done that, thank you. No. Um, and so it's not clear that people are necessarily get excited about these kinds of things. Uh, complex financial mechanisms such as budget formation, issuance of bonds, and tax law are often difficult for voters to understand. Give me some slogans or just sort of quick things you could say to somebody in an elevator why they should vote for you. So I'm John Chung, and you should vote for me because, and one, one or two sentences, just real quick. Well, the, uh, I, I don't really talk about the fiscal responsibility, right? I talk about trust. When we were in this, that last financial crisis, right, I was the person who kept California from defaulting on debt, right? I was the one who kept, I was the one who challenged Governor Schwarzenegger I was the one who didn't pay the legislature to make sure that we paid, that we had the money available so that we could use it for education. Okay, so, we could use so here it's, unlike Donald Trump, I didn't cause us to go bankrupt. The, I'm, I'm trying to get you some quick slogans here. <laughs> Maybe well, the audience can help too. Well, and well so, somehow, no, my, mine, is, uh, take the, uh, my, mine is taking a different road, right? Okay. The, uh, it's taking California to the bright and uh, prosperous future that uh, you know, that's symbolic of California. Okay. Um, so w you've been doing some things in the housing area, which is a big problem for the state of California, affordable housing. Uh, tell us what you're doing and how that can help, because obviously we know that in certain cities like San Francisco and certainly even in Berkeley, we have real problems with housing prices. So when I, in my inaugural speech as treasurer, I, I identified housing as, I said three priorities and he said, I listed housing number one. We are a million and a half units short here in the state of California, and our middle income, our low income individuals, and our young people are leaving this state in droves, right? So the last thing you wanna do is invest in our seed corn to have a Cal student graduate, go interview down the street at BI Pharmaceutical, right? I talked to the BI Pharmaceutical CEO, and I'll talk to Facebook, I'll talk to Bob Iger at Disney, and they all talk about housing. Right, so BI down the street says, we offer UC Cal graduates 80, 90, $100,000 upon graduation, right, in science, technology, or math, engineering. But the moment, and they already know it, right, you gotta pay $2,500 a month in rent, you know, in San Jose, or you gotta pay $3,500 a month in rent in San Francisco. They took off for Seattle, right, but they're not taking off for Seattle because Seattle has the same housing problems California has today, right? So they're off to Salt Lake City, they're off to Portland, they're off to Charlotte, North Carolina. So what I have been doing is I rewrote the affordable housing rules with input from building trades, environmentalists, developers, and developers who are both for-profit and non-profit. Second year after we implemented the rules, the, we increased affordable housing construction, new and rehabilitated, by 83%. Now, it's off a small base, right? So it's 14,000. We got it up to 26,000 units. The deep affordability needs for the state of California on an annual basis is 60 plus thousand, right? I wanna put us on a trajectory after I'm in office to get there. In addition, some of you read over the last month, I did some polling because I was thinking of putting on the 2018 ballot a uh, housing bond measure between six billion and nine billion, right? I wanted to try to get housing for 500,000 Californians. The legislature, Jim, Senator Jim Bell from San Jose had a $3 billion bond package in the legislature. It died last year it was, and it's, it got passed this year uh, it's on the governor's desk. So when the governor was trying to get two-thirds vote for cap and trade, he didn't have enough votes. 
So the Assembly Democrats said, hey, Governor, we want some support for affordable housing. That was part of the political trade. I was trying to get the legislature to up the bond, right? $3 billion takes care of about 65,000 units, maybe 100 and something thousand people. So they upped it to $4 billion, right? So it's a start. Then they passed Tony Atkins' bill, which provides a documentary f transaction fee to fund ongoing activity. And then there's Scott Wiener's legislation that would impl have implications on la land use programs. But what I would further do if I was the governor is to bring back redevelopment agencies. Uh, local governments don't have their local financing tool, right? And so when you build affordable housing, you need, a fe you need federal government contributions, state contributions, local government contributions. The federal government has pulled back. The state hasn't really done much since 2008. That's why we needed this bond. Local governments will have Tony Atkins' bill if the governor signs it, but they need more money. That's why we would bring back redevelopment agencies so local governments have more money so that they can hopefully build workforce housing so that teachers can live in their communities, that nurses can live in their communities, firefighters live in their communities, teachers can live in their communities. So let's end, we're to the last question. And my question to you would be is, tell us what you think your tenure as governor would lead to. Jerry Brown can say, I dealt with the fiscal crisis, I'm gonna have a really fast train, uh, and I'm trying to deal with the problems of water uh, in the state because I have a project for dealing with that. What would your signature accomplishments be? Uh, I wanna tackle income inequality. I wanna make sure that there are great schools uh, in every single community. I want to make sure that we build more incubators and accelerators uh, in local communities because you want local job formation that is responsible to the knowledge and skill sets of those particular communities. Uh, and then uh, I, in part in moving people out of poverty, right, that financing tool, building more housing so that we're caught up on the lack of affordable housing in this state. So I'm actually gonna ask one more question, which is there's a bunch of questions here about the Central Valley. And so do we have a problem in the state of California that we have a Central Valley that does not share in the wealth of the coast and that that's, for example, where a lot of Trump support was uh, located and it's based upon their concerns that they're not getting a piece of the pie that the coast is getting all the time. So what do you, how would you take your focus on income inequality and help the Central Valley enjoy the same prosperity as the coast of California. So I, I think the Central Valley and the Inland Empire will especially thrive, uh, right? You have uh, UC Merced, right? And like what you were talking about with Cal here and our extraordinary diversity, the, what I like about the youngest of the school systems, the University of California at Merced is it has the highest percentage of uh, uh, enrollment from uh, attendees who come from low income families and first generation going into college, right? And it's in the Central Valley. And so we know that the University of California spawn great economic activity. Mm -hmm. So as we further invest, not only in Cal, but if we invest in UC Merced and UC Riverside, right? And their housing is more affordable, right? I, com I commissioned a study by, some of you know Chris Thornburg. Uh, Chris used to be at UCLA, right? He's one of those talking heads on TV. Uh, comparing Texas versus California and economic competitiveness. And so if we want to compete against, and we're drawing parallels, Austin is the most expensive real estate market for a major me metropolitan market in Texas. The equivalent for cost structure in California is Fresno, right? So we ought to be building up the investment in Fresno, right? So when we're trying to compete against Texas, some of the manufacturing activity, the other types of activity, investing in Fresno, Riverside, San Bernardino to compete those types of industries against Austin or others. Uh, and that's frankly how we can make sure the Central Valley and that Inland Empire uh, flourish going forward in the 21st century. So you see opportunity. I see huge opportunity. Great, well thank you so much. It's been a tremendous pleasure to have you here.
I want to thank the Berkeley Forum, uh, great partners for this. Thank you so much. And I want to thank Michael Nacht uh, for this lecture series and for all he's done for the Goldman School. Good night, and thank you.